Hello, everyone. I'm Marcia Marley, president of Succeed Together, the parent organization of the Literary Festival. I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon for a special presentation of Succeed Together's Montclair Literary Festival at Home. I'm sure that you are as excited as I am to hear Eric Larson interviewed by Christina Baker Klein, two fabulous authors. I have been a fan of Eric Larson since I binge read The Devil and the White in the White City and years later consumed In the Garden of the Beast over several days. His latest and very and remarkable book, The Splendid and the Vile, was also impossible to put down. By buying your ticket for this literary event, you are also supporting the transformative work of Succeed Together. With the advent of COVID-19, our mission of closing the socioeconomic opportunity gap has become even more urgent as many more students fall behind. In response to this crisis, S2G has moved our programs online and we are offering them free to all students. I can report that the online tutoring is going well, to quote our students, wow, using Zoom is so cool, and thanks, I was getting a, say, a C and now it's an A. As with many small businesses and nonprofits though, donations are critical to sustain our work during this crisis. You can continue to support our programs by donating either online at Succeed Together or just press that teal green button on the bottom of your screen. Today's festival event and those in the upcoming weeks would not be possible without extremely capable and hardworking festival staff, volunteers, and particularly our generous sponsors. Thank you. Our festival director and also Succeed Together's program director is the amazing Jackie Moroth who will now introduce our authors. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. We're thrilled to have with us today two acclaimed novelists, New York Times bestselling author, Christina Baker Klein, formerly a longtime Montclair resident, is the author of eight novels, including Orphan Train and A Piece of the World. We're excited for her new novel, The Exiles, which is coming out in September. Christina will be talking with Eric Larson, the bestselling author of eight books, including the Devil in the White City, and Dead Wake. His newest book, The Splendid in the Vile, a number one New York Times bestseller, takes readers out of today's political dysfunction and back to a time of true leadership when in the face of unrelenting horror, Winston Churchill bound a country together. Welcome to Christina and Eric. Good afternoon. Hi, how are you? Hi, Eric. Oh, Hi, I'm so Christina. thrilled to be here with you. Um, I'm up in Maine in the midst of an incredible snowstorm, if you can I'm believe it. I'm not on Long Island in the midst of a windstorm, so hey. <laughs> so we're in storms, which is a very good way to begin our conversation about this stormy, this stormy subject and this in incredible book. Um, I'm really so honored to be here with you. Uh, we were supposed to be doing this together in person, as you know, um, and I've been thinking about it. Here we are, you know, you were supposed to be on this enormous book tour, which I think began and then got short circuited. Three and weeks, yeah. You're, yeah. you're talking to me from your home. So what has it been like? Well, it's been a, a process of adjusting to things like Zoom and so forth, um, because I'm I'm a person who uh, refused ever even to do Skype before all this, because I just I just disliked the technology. Now I've just sort of had to had to, had to do it every day multiple times. So that's fine. But you know, typically, uh, you know, this is this is this has gone so far reasonably well. You know, it's getting a little little dull. Gin helps. I'll, I'll be honest, but you know, it's here we are. Right, exactly. I think we, we deserve a drink when this is all done today. Um, so have there been any, uh, besides Jen, any unexpected sort of surprises or things you've enjoyed about the past few months um, of being home and talking about your books uh, online? 
Well, actually, <laughs> what's been incredibly satisfying and a complete surprise, actually, is that the uh, the reception for the book has um, has just really startled me and and, and uh, uh, just just kind of kind of blown me away um, because people seem to have come to the book almost for solace in this time, mm -hmm. um, which I, I, I guess I, I guess I get, but I also think, well, wait a minute, you're going to my book, which is about mass death and mayhem in one of the mm -hmm. darkest periods of world history. And that's solace. Things must be pretty bad. So anyway, that's, that's what, that's been the revelation of, of, of all this. Well, I wonder if part of what Jackie was talking about, that there feels that there's a void in leadership and Churchill was probably the strongest leader you could imagine has something to do with it. Well, I think that's, I think that's definitely it. You know, there, there is, you know, for all Churchill's faults and he was a deeply flawed man, make no mistake, but in this period, um, he, 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 did provide that sure hand, that total sense of confidence that things were, if not under control, that there was a firm hand at the tiller. This was a major storm, but we were, we meaning the British people, were going to get through it. And that's been a real distinction between the situation, the situation here in this country now. But you know, to talk about, I'd rather focus on on, on Churchill, honestly, and and, and you know, just the thing that made him. I think the thing that made him such a terrific leader for an awful time, you know, um, uh, was exactly the fact that that he he didn't, he didn't sugarcoat things, but he was also incredibly optimistic and confident. For example, in his typical his typical speech, he would he would provide the bad news. I mean, he did not hold back, and some of his speeches terrified people. Um, but then the way he structured his speeches, he would then come back with real grounds for optimism, real concrete grounds for optimism, not happy talk. And then he would close with with his classic rhetorical flourishes. You know, he would he would, you know, metaphorically or, or perhaps even literally have people rising from their seats and charging out in the street to do battle with the with the Nazis. Now we don't necessarily want a leader right now that will get us charging up out into the street, at least not without masks. But you know, this was a very this was a very powerful thing that that he did in, in that in that time. He one of the joys of reading your book is reading his words and the speeches and being able to see how he galvanized public um, opinion around him and how much people loved him. Uh, he's one of those rare figures that he was so polarizing, but he seems to have come at exactly the right time in history for what he was able to accomplish. Was that one of the things that drew you to the subject in the beginning? No, <laughs> no, actually the long sorted story of how I came to this book really actually had nothing to do with Churchill. Um, uh, I, 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 what I set out to do for various complicated reasons was to write a book that, that tried to get a sense of how on earth people in London actually managed to endure the, the, the so-called blitz, which the first phase of which was 57 consecutive nights of bombing the city of London. And I was really wondering well, how how on earth did that did that happen? And, and frankly, that was inspired by 9/11 and a move, my move to uh, to New York City, um, and just suddenly realizing, wow, what must that have been like here? Um, and and so I started thinking, well, then maybe I should do a book about the typical London family and how they actually managed to cope with that. Then I started thinking, wait a minute, why not the quintessential London family, Churchill, his family, his advisors, and that's how I came came actually to, to Churchill. It was as a sort of as a as a secondary effect that I realized, wow, this guy really knew what he was doing in terms of leading people through that period. I mean, I had not really known a lot about exactly how how he he went about it. He was definitely the man for the hour. Whether he was the man for the hour afterwards or before, I'm not. I can't really judge. But for for this period, for for May 10, 1940 to May 10, 1941, which is the period in my book, he really was the guy, the guy for the hour, the man for the hour. You know, Churchill is one of the most written about, studied, um, revered, um, debated characters in history. And your books usually focus on little known stories. This is a very well-known story. In fact, I was telling you in, in the green room before that I watched 
the season premiere of um, Billions last night, and that uh, the Paul Giamatti character is obsessed with Churchill and collects Churchill. And it, it just made me think that you're, you were wading into a subject. It's not your lifelong passion. What was it like to approach this knowing how much people already know about Churchill? Well, well, well again, I, I approached it from sort, of a, from sort of an oblique direction with this very specific question of how on earth did these people manage to survive that period? Again, 57 consecutive nights of bombing, and then this, the, what you could call the second phase, which was another six months of intensifying raids, but at longer intervals, separated, frankly, because of weather. Um, and so, I, so I came at I came at at, at Churchill Churchill obliquely. You know, I didn't like I said I didn't didn't really come to 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 him because of him. And therefore, therefore, um, I, the effect was actually incredibly daunting. It was like it's like okay, this is my idea. And then I opened the door and realized, wow, how much material had really been done already on on Churchill. I mean, I knew he was heavily written about guy. But I don't think I really had, well, I know, I did not have an appreciation of just how much had been written about and frankly, how much how much he had written about himself. And so, mm -hmm. so getting into the story, um, I, you know, I, 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 I was guided, I felt like somebody who just wandered into this jungle, but I, but I had a map and that was my question, my, my window, if you will, which is a very particular thing, which nobody actually had done before, which is to just to try to get a sense of how Churchill and, and his, his circle managed to get through that period, that that first year of his prime ministry, and so so my resolve um, early on was that I would read as much as I could about Churchill um, to get until I got a good sense of the lay of the land, the major events, um, and so that I wouldn't make any stupid mistakes. Yeah. And then and then. I jumped into the archives because that's where I feel most comfortable, and that's where I was confident I would actually be able to find fresh material. Again, guided by by my window, and that's the thing that helped me sort of keep the keep the terror of this vast sea of material at at, at bay. But it was it was really daunting, and I'm I'm not I'm not going to lie. I, probably every single day for the last four and a half years, I ask myself, what on earth am I doing? Well, I read in an interview somewhere that you said that, in fact, you discovered pieces that no one else had discovered because you were asking different questions. Well, that's it. That's it. This is what I find in, 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 in every time I do a book is that if you have a very particular lens that you look at history through, you're going to find things that are new or at least that will seem new to readers. I mean, other scholars may have come across them in the past, but they weren't interested. You know, if you're doing a vast a vast biography of, 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 of Churchill, as many have done in the past, you know, you're not necessarily going to pay attention to the fact that, uh, that you know, Londoners wore, um, began wearing little identity discs in case they got blown to bits. Um, you're gonna, not necessarily going to pay attention to the little details that I was after. So, so there's, <clears throat> there's a lot of little stuff that's this new, there's some, some big stuff that's new, and some one very new character who who I think makes the book, and that is Mary Churchill, and she is um, uh, Winston and Clementine's youngest surviving child. They had a, a young daughter who died years previously. So Mary Churchill, at the time of the the action begins, is seventeen years old and and turns eighteen during this this whole thing. But the beauty of this is that Mary kept a very detailed diary. And, and, and not just a detailed diary, but she's a, she was an astute, exquisitely literate young woman. Um, and, and she loved her father. She would talk about the dark events of the day and, and whenever criticism arose during that period against her father, it really, really hurt her deeply. And she would talk about that too. But at the same time, she was after all a 17 year old girl she really liked to have fun. She reveled in her life during this period. And that was a big part of my story is how did people get through this? I mean, it was not all, all horror and terror for, for a lot of people, including Mary Churchill. She makes references periodically to, to snogging in the hayloft and she would go to repeated dances at RAF, RAF um, uh, bases nearby. Um, she became a really important character and she's new. She's wholly new because I, actually at the time I got permission to use her her diary, I was at that point, I believe, one of two uh, two authors who had been given that opportunity to look at and to use her material. And for that, I am forever, 
forever grateful. But but you know there are many other things as well. Um, uh, elements of uh, gleaned from interrogations of of of, of, of Luftwaffe uh, pilots and crew who were captured. And these files to me were endlessly interesting. So anyway, there's a lot of new stuff. I am very very glad to say. I'm also very glad to say that I survived the process. Of course, I survived the process to go on tour for three weeks, you know, half of a six week tour, and then to end up completely locked in for the last two months. <laughs> well, interestingly, it doesn't seem to have affected book sales, as we say, as you know, you can as we can readily see from the bestseller list, because it has struck a chord. One of the things I see um, readers and reviewers saying over and over again is that it reads like a novel. You're, you're, all of your books do. And people are flabbergasted that you actually say that you don't fictionalize a single thing, that you, it's the weather of the day, the flowers that were present in the, on the, you know, in the vase on the table, the exact lines. You don't quote anything if it's not um, from research. I, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, sure. So to me, the, the, this actually, this cuts a lot to, to um, uh, uh, another crisis that I'm in actually at this moment, and that is trying to find my, my next idea. Because the, I think the key to, to writing history the way I like to write it is finding the right idea in the first place. Um, and, and, and there are a lot of criteria that one has to, that I feel I have to, I have to meet before I can pursue a story. One is it has to have a, an inherent narrative engine, something very compelling that, that just by the nature of the event will, will, will bring readers along. It also has to be something I'm interested in because, you know, if I'm going to be doing this thing for four years, I'd better be interested in the subject. Uh, but uh, uh, probably above all, there has to be a deep enough, rich enough archival reservoir to be able to find those little bits and pieces. Because I am convinced that it's the reader who makes my books come alive. I am, I am laying out the little bits and details that that I, I like to think will will raise will raise a little fire in in the imagination and maybe help people visualize and feel like they're part of this. This, this situation and that they're actually there. You know, you mentioned, mm -hmm. you mentioned weather, for example. Um, to me, weather, I'm a fanatic about weather. I'm a fanatic about finding, um, finding uh, weather to, to include in the book. And, and happily, uh, people kept a lot of, uh, lot of diaries. And, and diarists, for whatever reason, I found this before, historically speaking, they love to, to make annotations about the weather. So you're, you, you always have an indication of the weather. For example, in the case of this book, the, uh, the, early, the early months of Churchill's Prime Ministry, May 10th through, through that summer, the weather was fantastic. It was spectacular weather. And people commented, comment, commented on it all the time. Although there was one interval where the day was just exceptionally dark, so dark that people really sort of expressed a deep dread and that turned up in a number of diaries as well which i really love dread is a good thing in a narrative perspective but anyway so 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 if i if i don't have if, if i can't get access to that kind of really fine-grained material then it I, I i can't i can't do the book the way i want to do it so if it reads like a novel i mean i'm convinced that it's the reader who's 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 bringing that sort of sort of familiarity with novels and applying it to, to my to my books. But I'm glad to hear it, I'm well, glad to hear it. That's quite humble of you. But actually, as a novelist myself, I notice all these ways that you bring the reader into the story. For example, in this novel, in this novel, in your nonfiction book, which is uh, so dense and filled with so many different characters in Germany and in London and even the United States. Uh, but yes, well, let's not say dense, story. let's say rich. Rich. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Brawling. Uh, you, you've got, uh, you do these very short chapters, which bring this, the reader into the story, a, a small, a, a slice of the story, and then you pull back. And I'll say one more, which is that when you have an event with a lot of characters, you use one person as the vehicle in, the way into the, the scene. And so we're sort of shadowing that one person and we're, we understand their obsessions, their concerns, their fears. You feel very much that they're alive in the story. And otherwise it could just be a lot of military people moving around. <laughs> so I love that. And yeah, go ahead. 
Well, you know, first addressing the short chapters. So, so you know, I, I, I am a believer in short chapters. I think my longest chapters are <clears throat> my longest chapters are probably about ten pages. But, but, but uh, uh, beyond that, what I really am a big believer in is, is 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 physical texture in a book. So it's not just ten page chapters. I intersperse those with, you know, three page chapters, or in in quite a number of cases, you know, simply a, a one page chapter. And and you'll note as I. Perhaps you, you, you did know this, but uh, that the one-page chapters tend to occur with more frequency as the book nears its end, because you know that's when the pace is accelerating. And you know, honestly, okay. writing, reading, reading, and writing is a, phys is a obviously is a physical process. And and when you start shortening chapters, the pace be, uh, of the book picks up just just automatically by, by by definition. And that's kind of what you want as you approach the end of a end of, of a work whether it's non-fiction non-fiction or fiction the character thing i think is very important because because you know I, 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 obviously with with something like this you could end up you could end up wallowing in characters there were so many charismatic characters of the era and you would have this mm -hmm. this mass of 2000 page book that don't nobody would read so so i think it's very important uh, early on to decide who are the, the real life historical characters who will 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 take us through the book? People we can hold hands with um, to guide us through this thing, um, and so and 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 then it becomes a question of choosing the, the the most interesting, richest characters of the bunch, and also those who have the most significant role to play in this in this period. I mean, like like a lot of books about Churchill mentioned some of his advisors, but I really felt that, that it was important to, to spend a little bit of time dwelling on two of them in particular who played big roles in, in helping Churchill through this year and also in also in bedeviling him and bedeviling everyone around him. And one was his personal scientific advisor, Frederick Lindemann, aka the prof, whom uh, just about everybody in Whitehall, which is how people describe the seat of government in, in, in London, just but everybody in in London in Whitehall hated him except Churchill. Ditto for for Lord Beaverbrook, um, whom he immediately made his Minister of Aircraft Production, setting up a whole new ministry for him. He too was vastly disliked, um, and so these these two characters became really, I think, very vivid counterpoints to to, to Churchill and foils for Churchill. To, to play off, of course, when I say play off, I mean, this, we're talking about real events and real real activities. Yeah, no, that's true. And um, you also employ humor in the book in a way with those characters and with others. And I'm gonna ask you about that, but I just wanna tell our, our viewers that we have so many questions coming in. I'm gonna, this is my last question and then I will, I will um, take questions from the audience. So in the Times recently, um, a psychologist named Esther Perel noted that her Holocaust survivor father used to say, there's laughter in hell. So there's a surprising amount of humor in the book, as I've noted. Um, for one thing, your language, you describe gray barrage balloons as resembling airborne manatees. And you say that a bomber looks like a large dragonfly. And within the story too, there's romance, sex, petty arguments. Talk about how you sort of gave that verisimilitude, that feeling of life to the book in that way with humor. Well, you know, the thing is, these things, these things um, happened in the course of the, in the course of, in the course of that year. You know, you know, what I do, well, first of all, let me address the humor thing because it's, uh, it's funny. I, I was, you took, we talked earlier about, you know, daunting, how daunting it was to deal with, with church. Well, one day I was in a, a bar in New York back in the old days when we went to a bar. I was in a bar um, uh, for, for lunch, having a career counseling session with my daughter, who's also a writer, one of my daughters who's also a writer. And, and I told her that this is back about four or five years ago. I told her what I don't usually tell um, early on, but I told her what I was working on. She gave me this really concerned look like, Dad, He's been written about so much. What are you doing? That too ran through my life, my, my, my mind forever after. But then when the book came out, when she got a, a look at an advanced uh, reader's gallery, um, she read the book and she and she sent me the most, one of the most satisfying things a father can receive. She sent me an apology. She said, Dad, I had no idea this is what you were doing. She said, and, and you know what? It's funny. <laughs> and so so I was really feeling. But you know, when, I, when I'm putting, when I'm doing a book, and I'm collecting and immersing myself in, in archives and so forth. 
Um, I've, I'm always making note, of course, all about all the best stuff, all the most interesting things that make me laugh, things that I find compelling. Um, and I do have a sort of an interest in the sort of more titillated sides of history, I have to confess. But by the time I'm done, I will set everything out into a chronology. That is, everything will have, I give everything a timestamp, if you will, everything's coded, and everything goes into a, a, a long chronology, everything in chronological order. For this one, the chronology was 185 single space pages. What happens then, though, is that you see where everything falls into that timeline. And you see that, yes, in fact, I mean, this is the way life is. You have horrible things happening, the bombing of Coventry, then you have funny things happening. And, and it's, it's the, the juxtaposition, juxtaposition of, of, of real life. It's, it's, it's nuance. I mean, we all see this every day. I mean, here we are, here we are, you know, locked down in the midst of this nightmare, nightmare pandemic. But there have been some very funny moments, especially with things coming through on Twitter. I'm sure you've, Sure, you've all seen the one about the the dog who wants everybody to get out of his house and uses so much profanity that it's hilarious. But anyway, uh, I, I digress. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, I could go on and on, but I'm gonna, as I say, I'll take some questions. And here's one that's sort of interesting to me. Okay, uh, this is from Edward Remsen. He asks, it seems that Churchill had to deal with two lunatics, Adolf Hitler and his son Randolph. <laughs> what made you choose to describe, I think, Randolph's characters and actions so much? Oh, oh, what made me do that? Yeah. I just think he's a very interesting character. And, and also, I think he cuts to the, to, the, to, the, to the woof and weave and the true texture of life during that period. I mean, you know, Churchill had this son who was kind of a wastrel. He was difficult. He was, he was frankly, annoying. He was a, a, a drunk. He gambled. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, this is, this is how life really was during the Blitz. That's how people led their, led their lives in that period. So I really, I really felt it necessary to focus, on, focus a bit on him. But really, mainly my in, focused on him, my interest in Randolph, is my interest in his wife, Pamela Churchill. Pamela Digby, who, who uh, you know, Randolph was the son of the Churchill. She was, um, she was the, the Randolph's wife. I was really interested in her because I found her to be a very dynamic, very interesting character. And, you know, the, the, the course of their relationship, how it starts to blow up because of financial concerns and gambling and all this stuff. That was really compelling, I felt. So, so yeah, I, yeah. I'm guilty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why do you think people continue to be fascinated by the history of World War II? Why do I think people are fascinated by the history of World War II? I, you know, I, I, I guess my answer is, I mean, how could they not? You know, I mean, I mean it was this, this, this incredible you know, rupture in, in civility in terms of the long sweep of, of of, of, of world history. And to this day, I think we tend to see it, uh, and, and not terribly accurately, as, a, as the ultimate parable of good versus evil, Hitler being the, in, indisputably uh, one of the most evil, corrupt characters in the his, history of the world. And, I, and, and it had a satisfactory outcome in terms of good versus evil and so forth. Um, and I think that's infinitely, infinitely compelling. But it's also the case that uh, the World War II was just populated with some of the most, most, most compelling, rich characters that one could ever choose to read about. I mean, not just not just Churchill, but you know, you've got Roosevelt, you've got, you know, and if you get into the military campaigns, you've got all that aspect. I mean, it's just it, it it's it's inexhaustibly compelling. Mm -hmm. Right. Here are two questions that are related, so I'm going to put them together, sort of. So. Sarah Braley asks, I love the information. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. Here's a different one. In Dead Wake, Churchill didn't come off very well, but he is greatly admired in this book. How did you reconcile the two views? And then another question is, did your opinion of Churchill change during your research and writing? Wait, so, so we're on the first part of the question. Thanks, mate. About yeah, so um, the first part of the question, sorry, was that in Dead Wake, Churchill didn't come off very well. But here he is greatly admired. 
how did you reconcile the two views? I, I didn't. I didn't feel any need to reconcile anything because, again, life is life is what it is. People are who they are, and it's all about nuance and context. And frankly, in World War One, um, uh, Churchill. That was a term I was about to use, but I, I shouldn't. But anyway, Churchill was not the most adept um, leader of the Admiralty, uh, at least not as much as one would, would have hoped at the time. You know, it was the failed Gallipoli campaign for which he, he was rightly, I believe, rightly blamed. And then he got thrown out of out of that job. But, you know, um, uh, and then he was he was sort of basically in the, in the wilderness for a time. But, but you know, Come World War II, um, he really rose to the occasion. He was the man for the hour. Um, and again, like I said earlier, it's not to say that he, he was the man for the hour afterwards. And certainly the, the population of Britain did not feel he, he was. He was voted out of out of office essentially before uh, before the war actually ended. But but he was for this time. He was the man um, of the moment, um, and you can't dispute that. Okay, good. Um, so Audrey Wallach asks, I've enjoyed all of your books. I, my probably all time favorite is Devil in the White City. Uh, you have a book that you've written that you feel is your best and why? If so. <laughs> yeah, I never, I never offer an opinion on that subject because honestly, it's like, it's like, you know, who, who is my favorite child? And, and you know, every book, yeah. every book had its absolute absolute com compelling elements especially my first one even though nobody ever read it my first one was my first and i'll never forget that that was just a really kind of an exciting thing and gave me the, gave me the bug um i i guess one way to answer that is that that the, the book that i love the most is the one that i the one that i i, I most recently finished because you know mm -hmm. it's, it's 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 done <laughs> <laughs> so, right. and now it's time to find the next one, and and, and that that's the uh, that's the thing that I focus on. Now. I should I should throw out something also, by the way, that that um, I never I never reread my own books. I, I have mm -hmm. I have never reread one of my books. I mean, I'll reread passages because sometimes I like to read those during talks and so forth. But I just I'm just I'm I'm I'm, I'm done. And also, I know that if I reread one of my books, I will find all the little errors that now now appear to me to be errors. I know. I feel the same way. I also feel the same way about my latest book is my favorite. I like to believe that I get better with each book, but it could just be in my own head. Yeah, um, you know, I, I like to think that I get better with each book too, and, and and I strive to get better with each book, and that's and I think that's a very important motivating factor and it, it complicates to some extent my further searches for ideas but I, but you know I, I, I want it I want to get better and, and I know I, I will get better because writing is one of those things that you you never I don't think you ever, ever perfect and then you start mm -hmm. thinking you did perfect. your head tells you oh, that was the thing. that's great Kind of mm -hmm. um, I'm having trouble hearing you. I don't know if other people are, but just on that last question, I'm so sorry if I'm a little, I'm sort of trying to hear. Um, okay. Here's a question that got a lot of votes. Uh, Carolyn Gould, are you there? Am I here? Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. You're a purple screen for me, but it's fine. I'm going to keep going. Can you oh, hear okay. me? I can hear you, I can see you, and I can see you know, those things are going on. Yeah, I'm not sure either. I think other people lost the image as well, they said. Um, and oh, interesting. I can hear you, but I'll, I'll, let's keep going. Huh. And I'll... Um, huh. I, I, yeah, I've got my microphone here. I hear me perfectly. I wonder if it's a weather phenomenon. I do too. I hear you now. I hear you now. So we can't see you, but we can hear you. Right. And people are confirming that. So let's just plow ahead and keep going. We only have, um, you know, about eight more minutes or so. So Caroline yeah. Gold asks, your books seem like a labor of love based on how rigorously, rigorously they're researched. How do you decide what you want to write about? Well, again, that's the toughest part of that's the toughest part of what I do, um, and it, it, the ideas kind of come to me I, you know, half by half by chance. It's sort of a sort of a 
kind of a freakish thing. I mean, I, I try to put myself in the way of luck. Um, I venture out and, and read everything. I go to museums. I try to find whatever I can possibly find that would maybe make a good idea. But in the course of that, what typically happens is just by dumb luck, something will come up. And it's typically a question, quick, quick, sort of a question like, what, what would that have been like? Like, um, you know, my book about the Lusitania, what would that have been like to have been aboard the Lusitania um, on that last voyage? Or in the case of uh, In the Garden of Beasts, you know, what would that have been like, um, you know, to be have been living in Berlin during Hitler's rise to power in 1933-34 before, before we all knew, you know, what kind of monsters these people were? Um, and then I try to find out how to answer those questions in the most compelling way by finding the right characters to tell the story. So that's that's one way that, that ideas come about. Um, and I'm, I, yeah, like I say, I'm back in that journey now, and my publicist and friend Penny Simon refers to it as being in the dark country of no ideas. And that is uh, definitely where I am right now, but I am having a great time reading about everything. And it's, uh, you know, I just, just go swinging kind of like Tarzan from one thing Thing to another. I mean, I just came across an article about dung, be dung beetle ecoculture. So anyway, you know, uh, that's not going to yield a <laughs> yeah. anytime soon. But, you know, you never know when you when you stuff your mind with obscure facts, you know, you never know when there's going to be a connection and, and that that's what the, will cause the next book to arise. As I'm sure you, you feel the same way, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. curious about how your ideas come about. Yeah, I was doing an I was doing um, a Q and A with a writer the other day, a novelist named Alex George, and we were talking about how um, it feels like a spidey sense when you finally get a big enough idea. And um, you know, in some of my earlier novels, I didn't I would I would make it work. I would have a what I thought was a really good idea, and I would massage it and work with it. But now I feel like my life is. There, there are not enough years left for that. I want to only write the big ideas that, it, right. that come right. to me and that feel like they're actually interest, interesting right. on a lot of levels. Yeah. But you never know. Um, you never know if the, if, if, if the little idea, you know, just turns out to be the wonderful book that, that changes, changes the world, you know? I mean, uh, you know, the, this is something that I, 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 I deal with all the time. Uh, well, I'm dealing with now is like, you know, you can do a big book up, you know, about Churchill and big themes and, and, and whatnot. But then there and there also there's these these opportunities to, to write these lovely smallish books. I mean, for example, you know, one of my favorite books that I read years ago was was Davos Sobel's uh, Longitude. Um a mm -hmm. yeah. tiny, tiny book, but wow, what a what a book with this big heart. It just really kind of kind of lit my imagination. So there's that there's is that side of it too? Is like, what's next? Do I zig or, or, uh, when everybody else is zagging? Um, and yeah, another thing that is coming into my my idea um, process. Frankly, is this is the is this this the pandemic? I mean, there are things that maybe once upon a time I might have been curious about and interested in. And believe me, I'm not interested anymore. I mean, you know, I'm I'm done with thinking about the 1918 flu epidemic or the Black Death, which had actually occurred to me once to, 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 to do something about as a way to get to think about the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages. But um, no, I'm thinking I'm thinking of in very different directions now about about books, um, frankly, because of this this pandemic. Thinking also, honestly, one aspect that 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 I, I, I need to think about. It's a very practical aspect aspect is I don't know when physical archives are going to be accessible again and, 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 right. to, and to what degree. So um, I, I, I'm thinking about that as well. I mean, nothing, nothing bores me more than online research. So, uh, so I'm, I got to be, I got to be mindful of, of that as well. And nimble, you know, it, it, it's sort of adaptable. Yeah, like I say, zig when everybody else is zagging. Um, keep your knees bent, as an architect friend of mine said. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Eric, let's let's do five. I know we had said we would end at three forty-five, but let's do five more minutes because there's sure. so many questions. They're great. Um, actually, related to something you just asked, a few people have asked this question, um, including Paula, uh, which is, "What do you read? Do you prefer to read nonfiction or fiction? What inspires you, and, and what are you reading now?" <laughs> Yeah, you know, at the end of the at the end of the workday, obviously during the day when I'm working on books, it's just it's pretty much strictly strictly uh, well 
95% nonfiction, of course. Mm -hmm. But afterwards, I mean, it's like, you know, the last thing I want to do is read a nonfiction book after five o'clock. You know, I, I want to I wanna settle in with a good novel. And, and I'm a big one for, honestly, for, <laughs> for pure, pure escape. Um, I also love to lose myself in, 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 in really excellent writing. When I read someone's a book that just, just leads me in um, and, and doesn't let me go, I just, I just, I find that, I find that really, really a nice way to, to unwind from the day, to, to, to get distracted and so forth. I would say, however, it's, I'm, I'm kind of perverse in that respect. And that is that the better the book, the slower I read it. It's slower I read it. I still remember. That doesn't the, sound perverse. I get that. Yeah. <laughs> I still remember the, the experience of reading Tinker Tailor's Soldier Spy by John Le Carre. And I read that back actually when I had just started a newspaper job in, in San Francisco. And, and I read that book. It's a huge book. It's a huge book. And it's very difficult. Um, I mean, it's very difficult to follow actually some of the action. You have to kind of reread periodically. But but I was I reread that uh, I, I read that book ten pages a night. And I still remember the still remember the sheer delight of doing so. Because I was new at this job. I was new in the city of San Francisco and uh, you know, and it just was sort of my home for that for that time being. You know, you're reading for character and craft and and oh, yeah. structure and all of those things. I love that. Yeah, and, and, um, and I'm, I'm an every word reader. I, I don't ever skip. If I start skipping it, I'm done with the book. When you start a book, do you make yourself finish it or do you put them aside if you don't like it after? <laughs> that has evolved over time. Um, uh, it used to be that whenever I picked up a novel, I, I had to read it all the way through. I just made myself, I made myself do it, you know. Um, but uh, as the years have accumulated, I thought, you know, life is too short to just take a book, I'm moving on, <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Here's a good one. Um, I don't know where Eric went. I think I just disappeared even from this end. I'm back. Okay, uh, so in your research for The Splendid and the Vile, this is her question, what areas did you discover uh, interesting things that you eventually had to cut? And other people have asked a variation of that question. You know, what did you cut from the final story, if anything? Well, okay, so, so when I, when I, you know, whenever I turn a book into my editor, um, I, I like to think that I would be glad to see it in print the next day. I don't, I, I don't turn in what I would ever refer to as a rough draft. In this case, I turned in what <laughs> could best be described as an excessively long final draft. It was uh, quite literally twice as long as the current book, and the current book in print is 500 pages. So um, it, 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 I, where do I begin? What did I cut? I cut so much stuff, but I don't feel that, that in the end, uh, I, I know the book didn't suffer. I think the book benefited f for it. Um, but, you know, there, there were probably little grace notes, little details. One thing I cut was a was threaded through the middle part of the book, and it was a Scotland Yard investigation of the the disappearance of a man in the midst of the in the midst of the blitz his office building he was an architect worked for an architectural firm his building had been blown up and everybody had been accounted for many most dead actually but but um, everybody had been accounted for except this one man um, and there needed to be a determination of death before his wife could get death benefits and so forth. And so, so began this, this three month, three month Scotland Yard investigation of, of what happened to this guy, because, you know, he, he could have taken this opportunity to, to, to take a flyer and create a new life. You know, um, I know somebody who wrote a whole book about that phenomenon. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I found this fascinating. I loved all the Scotland Yard details, the records. I, I love it. You give me a good old fashioned police file, and I, I just go go to town, right? So, you know, this was great. You know, witness interviews, the whole thing was just really terrific. And you know, all this as bombs were flying, and here's this intrepid Scotland Yard investigator doing this investigation to find this guy. And the ultimate decision was um, the formal conclusion. The formal coroner's conclusion was the man was quote unquote blown to bits. Mm -hmm. I loved it. You know, this is my kind of little sort of diversion, uh, digression. However, it was in, in this case, it was it was just it was not uh, not something I could afford. And so that got removed from from the book. But mm -hmm. I did that with some regret. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Um, two more questions. 
So this one is uh, from Olga. What are your thoughts on the sacrifice that the other countries of the empire, such as India, to fight the war uh, were? And um, do they deserve more credit? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, you know, if I were getting into the, if I got into the sort of the, the, the military side of this, the military campaigns, um, you know, there, there, there was a, there, there was a, there was a, it's not a myth, um, but there is the belief that, that 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 Britain um, uh, Britain was alone, you know, after France fell. Uh, the reality is is it is it, it, it's somewhat more nuanced, somewhat different. And that is that yes, the British Isles were alone of, uh, among those in the vicinity of Hitler's in, in Hitler's reach, but but there was the British Empire. There was Canada. There were the Australians provided provided. You know, significant uh, um, forces at at for campaign for many of the campaigns during World War II. New Zealand forces, Indian forces. Um, so, so that was a, a, a that is a nuanced element that that does need to be considered, but not in my book, because I was working on something very specific and very very direct. The problem is, the problem is, if you start to pursue every angle that you'd, you'd kind of like to pursue, suddenly it becomes once more this 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 long amorphous book that nobody's gonna read. So. Or multi-volume, I guess. Multi-volume. Like many of those Churchill multi-volume books. Like Martin Gilbert, who did an eight-volume biography of Churchill, and then of the 14 volumes of companion, 14 companion volumes consisting entirely of documents. That's a little beyond my, my, uh, my capacity or my interest. Pretty amazing. All right, here's the final question, and 10 people have asked variations of this question. Okay. What's going on with all the movie and television interest for all your various books? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Well, you know, I, 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 I give you a quick rundown. I mean, you know, there, there are options on, um, on <clears throat> in, in the Garden of the Beast, Tom Hanks. Uh, things were, were actually rolling around pretty well um, uh, until this this pandemic. So things, everything's getting pushed pushed back and and maybe even reconsidered. But anyway, that option can persist. Um, who knows what's going to happen with that? Um, Devil in the West City, um, the current iteration, the plan is to make it a limited, so-called limited TV series, so we used to call it a miniseries, you know, sort of like, uh, anyway, it's going to be done by Hulu, um, uh, and uh, I love that idea because it's a very complicated book, and I, it, it, I, I've always been concerned about someone trying to pack that into a single feature film. Um, we have uh, uh, something underway that I can't really discuss yet about Thunderstruck. Um, so that's that's where we are. And what about this book? This book doesn't have anything, no, uh, no option as yet, but there are there are rumblings of interest and from various quarters and we'll see what happens with that. Again, well, my, again, course. my feeling would be that the, the best way to do this would be to do it as a uh, as a as a limited TV series, sort of maybe a prequel to The Crown or something like that. Absolutely. I mean, people are, I'm pointing to the side, but people are uh, saying that, that it's very, it feels like a television series, yeah. that it would be a natural. That would be great. That. Yeah, that would be great. Um, but in the meantime, we'll just have to um, enjoy your books and read and reread them. Um, Eric, it has been so amazing having you here and um, captive with us for <laughs> an hour um, and to hear something about your process. And I'm so glad we got to get people's responses in real time. Me too. And I'm glad people took this time out in the afternoon to, to sort of dwell with us. And and Christina, I look forward to your uh, your next book, The Exiles, which is coming out when? It's coming out in September. September. Thank you for asking. Uh, and that was a book that required a lot of research. I mean, we, you and I have been friends for a few years now, and it's always a joy to be able to talk to you about research because what you do is so much more than I do, and yet I feel overwhelmed by my own. So, um, and you're a great inspiration to me. Well, thank you. So I think someone's coming on and wrapping up, I believe. Um, yes, here we go. There we go. A, a, a placard, here we are. 
you so much, Christina and Eric, for this fascinating conversation this afternoon. We've been so blessed to have you with us this afternoon. It's been absolutely great. Thank you. We also wanted to thank our festival sponsors, our festival partners, our festival friends, all of the people who have helped to put on this festival, um, on the Festival at Home series, plus our festival that we're still planning for September 12th. In addition, I just wanted to let you know about our next upcoming events. So we have Nicholas Christoph and Cheryl we done next Tuesday night at 7 p.m. talking about tightrope Americans reaching for hope. Then we have Mo Rocker and Mo Bitteries on Tuesday, May 19th, and then Colin McCann with his um, book A Paragon on Wednesday, May 27th. And with that, I would like to thank you all for coming. Thank you again, Eric and Christina, and good afternoon, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>